10 years ago today, Five Nights at Freddy's would release, becoming one of the biggest indie games of all time. And while there are plenty of timelines recapping the lore of the franchise, today I thought we'd take a look back on the games themselves. This is the history of Five Nights at Freddy's. Before making Five Nights at Freddy's, Scott Coffin was making games for over two decades. His first one was Doofus in 1994. It was a really basic side-scroller where you play as this thing, and you shoot arrows at things. It's super glitchy, but it still works. Somewhat. Now unfortunately, we don't know the official year that ScottGames.com started, but it seems like it started somewhere in the late 90s to early 2000s. The Wayback Machine takes us as far back as 2003. ScottGames.com was a place where he could showcase all of his future projects, and keep the community involved in what was going on. And throughout the 2000s, he would continue releasing all these very interesting games, and some animations. Some of them were based in religion, and some of them were just fun little projects, but one game that really stood out to me that was taking Scott in the animatronic direction was a game called The Desolate Room. What stood out to me about the game was its design, as well as its animation. Some of these aesthetics feel a bit familiar to what we see in the FNAF franchise, especially when looking at these endoskeletons. Now this game was followed up in 2012 with a sequel called The Desolate Hope. This game was released on Steam, and I think that it had some traction to it, but obviously not that much. And then a year later, a very important game would come out. One that would change Scott Coffin's life forever. Chipper and Sons Lumber Company. Although the game is alright, the design of the wood chippers looks a lot like the Freddy Fazbear design, which was probably a strong inspiration for Scott later on when he made FNAF. And speaking of inspirations, the reason the game is significant is because of its criticism from players, and especially one reviewer. YouTuber and game reviewer Jim Serling stood out. Jim's comments were too foreshadowing, take a listen. You may notice the dead, terrifying, soulless eyes of the background characters, that's uh... A signature of Chip and whatever the f it was called, Chipper and Sons. Ghastly faces twisted in a grimacing mockery of joy. I imagine the phrase, kill me, is stated over and over again in the world of Chipper and Sons. Robots, they're, that's what they are, they're robot beavers. And oh boy, the comments weren't off either. I think someone predicted a meme. And this got Scott thinking. Now around this time, creepypastas were at their prime, with alternate timelines of pop culture's items being created like monster mascots at Disneyland, and toys from the 90s coming to life to haunt you. A childhood relic that Scott grabbed from this era was Chuck E. Cheese. The animatronic's candid appearance and childlike environment made for the perfect horror setting to go off of. The game was made as per usual with Fusion Click Team. Instead of moving around like most horror games, this one has you seated, and there are certain things from the game that are taken from other forms of media. Like the jump scare sound. This is taken from a film from the 80s called Inseminoid. And the song that plays when the power goes out is actually 150 years old. It's called To Reader by Georges Bizet. As for the other sounds, they come from a royalty-free website called Sound Dogs, which would also be used in future FNAF games. Now there is some content that's left out from the game, like a lives counter appearing in an early beta that's still stuck in the files. And for this first game, we got five animatronics. That of course being Freddy, Chica, Bonnie, Foxy, and Golden Freddy. It only took Scott around six months to actually make the game, and a trailer was released on June 14th of 2014, which showcased what was to come. In the trailer, we famously see Bonnie running, but I guess that just didn't make sense. And this was also a bonus thing I was curious about. We can't see that far back into the trailer's performance view-wise, but I was able to go back to August 13th, five days after the game released, and just look at how low the view count was. And Scott barely had any subs. Just imagine how low that view count must have been before the game released, compared to today. Now before the game even released though, we actually got our first Let's Play. It was uploaded all the way back on July 26 by Ben the Scoopiest, with some really positive reception. And with that being said, on August 8th of 2014, Five Nights at Freddy's would release on Desura, an indie game distribution platform. It would hit Steam 10 days later. Only a few days upon release, the game would start gaining traction within the community. And from what I've gathered, Jim Sterling was the first major YouTuber to play it. Hello you 
Nine of Empires, Jim Sterling here, and this is, God help me, Five Nights at Freddy's. And then only two days after release on August 10th, Yamimash played it, and then Markiplier would release his famously titled Warning, Scariest Game in Years video. And since that point, the game blew up. In the first few weeks, Five Nights at Freddy's had sold over 30,000 copies on Steam, which is a major feat for an indie game that was uploaded by some unknown dude. Any video involving Five Nights at Freddy's automatically was getting a ton of views, and within the first month, Five Nights at Freddy's sold over 250,000 copies. But as the game was being played for its scary mechanics, players began noticing their surroundings. One of the first notable and questionable things that we hear is Phone Guy talking about the Bite of 87. And they used to be allowed to walk around during the day too, but then there was the Bite of 87. And then the missing posters, the glitches, and it's me. And I will say from a game developing standpoint, not that I know how to make a game, I think these hooks were really good. It turns out that there was more to the game than we thought. And although at least for me, I wasn't able to pinpoint the first ever theory video talking about what was going on in the game, I do know one thing. A month into the game's release, YouTuber Game Theory would release his video talking about Five Nights at Freddy's for the first time. Now from what I remember, I think this video was re-uploaded, I forgot why, if YouTube took it down or whatever, there's some sort of copyright issue, so that's why it says October, but I do remember the video being uploaded in September. Also in September, we would finally get the mobile version of the game, with the Android version coming out on August 27th, and iOS on September 11th respectively. So lore-wise, what did we learn from the first game? Well, it has haunted killer animatronics, kids have gone missing that are linked to the animatronics coming to life, some sort of event called the Bite of 87 happened, and we have all these weird cryptic messages. And for a moment, this was just an indie game with a fun little backstory, and that was it. Well... So soon after FNAF released on mobile, a teaser popped up on Scott's website. It simply showed a broken down Freddy with the number 2 on it, and a release year of 2015. Then in late September we got another teaser, and another one, and another one, and then we got this image, but what made this unique was that this was the first time that we've ever gotten an easter egg teaser, a new tradition that Scott would continue utilizing with his fans. As for the development, there were 11 characters in this game. So we got the toy line of the main characters, and the withered line, we have a new one called Bloom Boy, Golden Freddy, Shadow Freddy, and the most notable one was the puppet, just for its new game mechanics. The music box song that accompanies it is actually a real song, it's a rendition of My Grandfather's Clock. And the jump scare sound once again comes from a movie. It's very subtle but you can hear it in Saw 2. People have also found that there was supposed to be a toxicity meter in the game, it was left in the files but it was never used. In a super exclusive interview with Daco, Scott explains that originally this was supposed to be to prevent the player from keeping the mask on, you know, forever. If I remember correctly, I think that the toxic meter put the mask on, this meter starts running out, that didn't really seem to, to, to fit, it just didn't make quite as much sense. Yeah, like was the mask toxic? So instead he added the music box feature. So on top of checking for the animatronics, now you have to wind up the music box. There would also be minigames that also were helping to explain the story, don't forget to mention the trailer, and the game would make a surprise release super early on November 10th of 2014, followed by mobile a few days later. And again, good reception from the fans. It was intense, it was scary, and we got some new lore. As you may have remembered when FNAF 2 first released, people thought that it took place in the modern day, like it took place in 2014, because we had these like rundown old animatronics from the first game, and then we had these new line of the toy animatronics, and one of the first theorists to break this was Game Theory, who challenged this timeline and said that FNAF 2 was a prequel. Us using minimum wage calculations to identify the year of Five Nights 1 is a perfectly valid way to prove it, and shows that it takes place after the events of Five Nights 2. Through some detective work, that this game took place in 1987, the year of the Bite of 87. And through the minigames we would also learn about someone called Purple Guy. I think it's been made pretty clear at this point that there would be another game. On December 6th of 2014, Scott Games' website once again was updated, but this time it said offline, and we were like, oh okay, but then someone turned up the brightness on the image, and on the bottom it says until next time, confirming that we have a third game. 
Then on January 2nd of 2015, the website was updated again, with the text reading, I'm still here, and fans would dig deeper into every photo that was published. If you inspect Element this page, you'll find some secret text saying 30 years later. This was once again a new element for Scott to engage and play with his fans, and drop little clues for them to discover. We soon got a tease of the layout of the map, and then near the end of the month, on the 26th, we got the trailer for FNAF 3. During development initially, there was supposed to be a seal button apparently, and a seventh night, and the lives counter makes a comeback again. There were six characters in total for the game, with us getting the phantom line of the iconic animatronics, and a new character called Springtrap, which we learned later on embodies William Afton. Also, you wouldn't believe where the screams came from. Except for you. I remember this being one of those crazy fun facts for a long time, and I think the reality is that the same asset was just used for these two. So what do we learn from FNAF 3? We learn a bit more information about the Bite of 87. Potentially one of the reasons for this happening was because of a springlock suit. And then we also see William Afton getting pushed to the wall by the ghost children. He puts on his springtrap suit only to get crushed. We also learn who the puppet is, an entity that places children's souls into the animatronics. And there were two different endings that you could get at the end of FNAF 3. The first one was the bad ending, where you die. And the second one is where the place burns down. And that's it, if you get the good ending, then that's it. I mean, William Afton is gone, and I guess the day is saved. Nah. If you turn the brightness up on that image, you will see that William Afton survived. Okay, so one of the biggest reasons that Scott made FNAF 4 was because of some criticism. The jump scares in the third game just weren't really that scary, and I think it's fair to say that FNAF 4 has one of the scariest atmospheres ever and one of the scariest jump scares ever. And that's mostly because this game takes us to a child's bedroom, and setting the game in something that we are familiar with, like a home, is definitely going to do the trick. And we have some new game mechanics that were added. Instead of being seated in one area, checking a tablet for animatronics, we now have to get up and walk to different doors and spot animatronics from a distance with a flashlight. I mean, that's horrifying. If you did that in real life, that would be horrifying. And we also semi-return to the scream from the first game that's kind of mixed, and there are now seven animatronics, being the Nightmare animatronics, and we got two new characters, Nightmare or Shadow, and Plush Trap a plush version of Springtrap seen in the minigames. We also got Knight Mariani in the Halloween update, so what did we learn from FNAF 4? So initially when we all saw this, we thought this was the Bite of 87, when in reality, this scene takes place in 1983, where this springlock suit bites a child's head off at the Fredbear Diner. So what we saw in the third game wasn't the Bite of 87, it was the Bite of 83, and we're playing as that child. We know that based on the items in the room, again thanks to the likes of Game Theory. Flowers and IV and pills will occasionally show up next to your bed. Classical medical supplies that show us that this is a child in recovery. And you assume that FNAF 5 is next? Nope. So over Scott's long period of making games, he's actually made a good amount of RPG games. So making FNAF World was kind of natural for him. He was in his element. The reason that Scott made this game that kind of didn't relate to the past four games was because he needed to put out something a little more lighthearted to take a break from writing all these dark stories. Now this game had some missing content, like a line from JJ, Now I'm going to kick your ass! and a spirit of the box. And out of any FNAF game ever, this has the biggest amount of characters that you can play with. There were 48. Initially, the game was released on September 15th of 2015 for $10 on Steam, but it was taken off. There was some feedback from fans about the game being in an unfinished state. So on February 8th of 2016, Scott would release a patched version of the game, and he made it free. And I think at this point, players were waiting for what was to come. Now the player was roaming around the entire facility, with the goal being to repair and watch animatronics. There were 8 animatronics in this game, with some new characters as well, like Circus Baby, Ballora, the Minarinas, we got the fun time iteration of our classic characters, and Ennard. And side note, we also got to hear our first animatronics that can talk, like Circus Baby. I don't recognize you. You are new. There's some unused audio of Funtime Freddy talking in an accent that sounds like that old Tom Hanks guy from Elvis. Hello, little children! Glad to see you back again! 
Come closer. I'll sing a song for you. The only thing that matters is that that man gets up on that stage tonight. Now, in Sister Location, we learn that William Afton's son is the main character in the game, and Circus Baby is his sister that's trapped in the animatronic. Get it? Sister Location? Scott wasn't satisfied with his conclusion for the FNAF franchise, so he decided to make a sixth installment. Work on FNAF 6 started in 2017, but this time it was more secret. There were no teasers for this game. Scott felt that the usual teasers would be too fatigued at this point. Like that, that would fatigue people, but at the same time I needed to resolve a lot of issues with the story. And so those two factors combined, that's the way that I handled it the way that I did. I worked on that game for a year in secret, all the while the fan base was, you know, getting pretty agitated that you know, I wasn't talking to them and I wasn't working on anything. The purpose of it was not to make a lot of money. The purpose of it was not to build a lot of hype. It was just to resolve some plot points. So the entire time, fans were left confused on what was going to come next, if something was going to come next. And for most of the year, fans didn't hear anything. At first, it looks like your typical business sim game, but then we get surprised. It's a hybrid FNAF game and a sim game. Soon after the release of Pizza Simulator, Scott announced an Ultimate Custom Night game mode. But as Scott continued working on it, the game mode became so big that Scott just made it its own game, which would be released on June 27th of 2018. It featured over 50 animatronics, each had their own difficulty level that you can change. And there are approximately over... yeah different ways that you can play this game. And I think it's really cool that both of these games are free. As VR gaming became more accessible to more people, it seemed that Scott was interested in entering this space with the FNAF franchise. It only made sense, honestly, but he couldn't do it alone. Programming a VR game is completely different. You definitely can't make a VR game in Click Team Fusion. So for the first time ever, Scott turned to someone else to develop one of his games. That being Steelwood Studios. Maybe he was looking for a team that could create a 3D immersive VR experience. This would also become one of the first console games for the FNAF franchise. This game was made on Unreal Engine 4. And although the game was announced in 2018, it already had a Steam page in 2017. And the game would release in 2019. So what did we learn from Help Wanted? Well, this game takes place after FNAF 3. And it's supposed to be Fazbear Entertainment's VR experience. The point being that the simulation is supposed to get rid of any wrongdoing that Fazbear Entertainment had. But but things go wrong. William Afton is back as Glitchtrap, clearly haunting the game now. The game comes packed with some minigames as well, with the addition of the Dreadbear DLC, which was released for Halloween. Also that same year, on December 3rd, we got Freddy in Space 2, which is a sequel to a minigame from FNAF World, originally called FNAF 57, Freddy in Space. FNAF Security Breach changes everything. For the first time, we're actually able to roam around in a FNAF game. It takes place in a mall entertainment complex called Freddy Fazbear's Mega Pizza Plex, and it features five different locations. A beauty salon, a bowling alley, a golf center, a go-kart track, and a daycare. The main character gets trapped overnight and has to escape. Some characters that the player may encounter include the Glamrock animatronics, Roxy, DJ, Windup, Daycare Attendant, Gator, The Blob, Staff Bots, and the scariest of all, the wet floor bot. And then there's Vanny, who is not an animatronic, who appears to be under the control of Glitchtrap. So what do we learn in Security Breach? William Afton takes a new form as a glitch trap. Glamrock Freddy is our ally in the game, William Afton is defeated, and this probably takes place after Pizza Simulator. And it appears that there's some unused locations in the game, like a warehouse, some sort of utilidor system, and exterior parts of the complex. The game again was praised by fans, but Security Breach was also met with mixed reception about its lore, with William Afton coming back again. Some people think that it was just fan service, questioning why to introduce Vanny if she isn't that important. In a recent interview with Daco, Scott says that Glitchtrap wasn't supposed to move. 
When it comes to Burn Trap, originally, Burn Trap was never supposed to move. He was supposed to just be something you saw in the corners, or like if you were walking past the machinery, you might be able to peek in between two things and see him in the corner or propped up against a wall, almost like some kind of decaying movie prop, and you never fully understood what his purpose was. And he had a very specific purpose, and I'm not going to say what that purpose was, but realistically, he never moved. And most recently, on December 14th of 2023, we got the sequel to Help Wanted. There isn't really much to go over in this game. It's just a game that builds on the first one in every way possible, from its graphics, having more minigames, and some better mechanics that go with the games. In 2021, Scott Coffin would announce his plans to retire, but he's still working behind the scenes. There's some exciting projects in the works, like Five Laps at Freddy's, Into the Pit, and the Dead by Daylight collab. But regardless, Five Nights at Freddy's captured modern online horror at its best. It understood the aesthetics that we're used to seeing today. This game has changed many creators' lives over the years, or have boosted their careers beyond what they were before, and even helping some get their foot in. I was one of those people. This video is my memento to Five Nights at Freddy's. It's a franchise that entertained me, helped me, and inspired me for the past 10 years. And it truly would be nothing without the community. So thank you guys for watching, and I will see you in the next one.